Buonasera, sera, everybody, or should I say bonsoir? Because tonight in La Cucina Quarantena, we are going to be doing beef burgundy, beef bourguignon, which is one of the traditional recipes in Burgundy in France, which is just to the south of Paris. Uh, so tonight what I'm going to be doing is a little bit of a longer cooking project. I think that weekends are a great time to do something uh, cooking wise that maybe it would take you a long time to do. Uh, so you have the time to just sort of play with it. And I'm going to base my recipe today off of a couple of, couple of different techniques, things that I've learned uh, in my travels and also some traditional recipes. Um, so come on over Nico and let's have a look at our ingredients. First of all, we need a pot. So this particular pot is a stob, it's a coquette, uh, which is a very, very nice Dutch oven. And what makes a Dutch oven fantastic, this has got garlic on it, um, is these little nodules on top. So what happens is that when you cook something in here for a long time, it's cast iron, but what happens is that the, the vapors go up, they gather, and then these little kind of nodules make them drip back down. So it's a way to keep whatever you're cooking moist and keeping the flavors sort of together. This weighs a ton. This weighs an absolute ton. So this I know from experience, I almost dropped it and like shattered the floor. Yeah, he almost dropped it. So, um, okay, so what we're going to do today is we're going to build flavor. That is the goal with beef burgundy, is you want to have a beef stew, but you want to really build flavor. And the traditional recipe has a lot of great flavor elements in it, but we're gonna to try to up that a little bit tonight. First of all, the recipe that I'm basing it on is my favorite cookbook of all time, New Basics. Uh, and I'm going to use this as our basic recipe. So eight ounces of thick sliced bacon, three pounds of beef chuck, one cup of chopped onions, salt and pepper, three tablespoons of flour, three cups of wine, three cups of stock, two tablespoons of tomato paste, one tablespoon of rosemary leaves, carrots, uh, pearl onions I'm not gonna do, uh, then eight ounces of fresh mushrooms, butter, and then it has red currant jelly and Italian flat leaf parsley. So I'm not going to exactly follow this. Uh, the Julia Child recipe is kind of the classic, and that one is more or less the same, but I'm going to use my own techniques uh, to kind of build the flavor slightly differently. So I'm gonna start with the bacon. So we'll just look at our ingredients that I have set out. Come on over, Nico. Okay. Bacon, we have garlic cloves, we have rosemary, we have carrots, we have onions. I'm not doing pearl onions, so I just um, added more onion and I cut it a little bit more roughly. I just find the kids don't eat the pearl onions, right? That's a pearl onion. <laughs> exactly. Um, garlic to taste, I'm gonna do five cloves. Beef. Lots of beef. Lots of beef, and I'm gonna show you why I bought this beef in just a second. A whole bunch of wine. Uh, flour, and then this is my extra secret thing I'm adding. Uh, misto di fungi sacchi, so mixed dried mushrooms that are from Italy, which I have um, soaking in hot water. So uh, instead of using three cups of beef broth, I'm doing beef broth, and then I'm gonna use the, the water from the dried mushrooms. So to start building our flavor, I'm gonna toss in my... Um, just remember when you're cooking with these cast iron pans, you don't want to have a raging fire because the point with these is that they build up heat over time and you can't actually cook them at super high temperatures. It's not good for them. So you gotta keep it kind of medium to medium high. That's enough, enough fire. So we're gonna start by getting this rendered. Now, typically, I think it's in the Julia Child recipe, you're supposed to take the bacon out once you have done this step. I'm not doing that, I like bacon. so. I'm just gonna do this. Why would you ever that... take why would you ever take the bacon out? That's a good question. Why would you take the bacon out? That just seems silly. Um, so I'm gonna let this just kind of start to slow cook. I don't I think I might have it even just a little too hot because I don't want it to crispify necessarily. Okay, so while I'm while that's cooking, I'm gonna show you what I did about meat. Now instead of getting stew meat at the grocery store, I bought a very nice looking pot roast. This mm. pot roast looked a lot prettier, actually, because it has all that marbled fat in there. It looked a heck of a lot nicer than any of the stew meat that I came across. And here's the weird part. It was a lot cheaper. This ended up being like half the price to cut up stew meat. And the thing with stew meat that I think is a little bit concerning is that regular stew meat at the grocery store, you don't know who's handled it. You don't know you know, how it's been handled. You don't and even know what meat it is. You don't even know what meat it is. So when you buy your own cut and you start with your own cut, you know, and then you can also cut it to whatever. 
By the way, these are my new knives, I think I mentioned, and having an extra sharp cooking knife, oh boy, it is a game changer, I tell ya. It makes everything so much more fun when you're cooking with nice knives because you you're not struggling and things, look at that, didn't even have to try and this meat just gets completely cut up really nicely. So if you don't have some nice sharp knives, uh, these are from Amazon and I'll try to put a link up later for the one that I picked out, but it's wonderful how these days good cutting knives are actually not super expensive. So you can see I'm cutting these into chunks that are about, oh, I would say one inch cubes, something like that. Let's check on our bacon. Yeah. Now, obviously we're gonna start this and then we're not going to have it done at the end of this video because uh, it's gonna have to cook a long time, but I have the oven already warmed up to 350 so that once we get this part done, I'll pop it in the oven and then uh, in the comments section later tonight, I'll post a photo of our um, completed project. Oh man, you can't beat the smell of cooking bacon. <laughs> bacon, Nico, you are absolutely right. So Nico's joining me tonight as my cameraman. Good evening, Nico. How are you, my love? I am pretty good. Do you want to tell everybody what our fall has been like today in, C in Seattle? Uh, that nice fall weather. Uh, yes, this is it's been wonderful weather. It's it's freezing outside. <laughs> it is just frigid. It is so cold. Well, and you know, it's not terrible. So that's why it's kind of nice to have a little bit of a cozy day. So we played board games. And now we're Which we making, should play again after this. We are going to play board games. We're playing the game of life. And so after this, we're going to um, resume our board games. So I was thinking as we were playing board games how cozy it is today. And I thought that if it's a cozy day, we need to eat cozy food. So that's why we are here today having beef burgundy. All right, so if you have a look over here, Nico, you can see that we have a nice amount of the bacon grease. And that's what we're going that is to... It's a lot of bacon it's grease. It's a lot of bacon grease. But what we're going to do is... Uh, this is actually three pieces of bacon cut up. You could have done more. I could have done a lot more, actually. But I just decided on three pieces. So if you like the taste of bacon, you could certainly add more. But now, I'm going to go ahead and start adding my beef in. And what you want to try to do with the beef... They actually suggest, in a lot of the techniques for beef burgundy, to do this in batches. Because you want to make sure that the beef browns on all sides. So with this much beef, even if this is a large pot, I can't possibly brown all of it perfectly. So I'm sort of gonna do it in batches. I'm gonna take my time on this. And the reason you wanna do this, this is another flavor building experiment here. Um, you want to make sure that all, each of the individual faces of these beef cubes is brown. And I'm gonna let it sit there for a second. And the reason you want to do that is twofold. One is you want to build flavor. So every time that you singe, you sear a side, that's going to help to infuse the dish more. But also what it's going to do is when you sear the meat on all sides like this, you're going to seal in flavor too so it doesn't get dried out. But we're always thinking, oh, look at that. It's nice and brown. Wow, See, that quickly. Yeah, look how pretty that is. It's perfect. What we want to see. Trying not to drop the phone into the. Yeah, don't drop my phone into the. The pot. Like Two thousand dollar phone. Yeah, we don't. Mama doesn't need to replace her iPhone right now. But look how pretty that is, and what a nice piece of beef. So this was just a pot roast from Safeway, not anything too fancy. Uh, but it, I always look when I buy something for beef burgundy with nice marbling. So if you look over here at the beef I was cutting up, you can see how nicely marbled it is. Uh, that's usually a good sign of a, of a good steak, but it's also nice for um, a roast as well. You get the, the nice marbling. Uh, because that means that as it cooks, that fat is going to break down and it's going to make the meat a lot more moist. And that's really the whole game here is we want this to all be as tender as possible. Now, words of the warning. Buy yourself nice new knives, just really keep your fingers away from them. She's already cut herself like twice. Yeah, I cut myself twice on these new knives. And we've only had them for like three days. Yeah. Yeah, I've cut myself a couple times. And the thing is that when you have new knives, you cut yourself and you don't even know you did it. 
Now you might think, well, geez, that was a big chunk of fat that you, like, why would you put that in your stew? You could throw this away. Look at that. And this one here, yeah. I'm gonna consider, I'm gonna put set these aside and what I might do is just use those as uh, flavor builders for later. Keep the beef in, so. That is a ridiculous amount of fat. It's a ridiculous amount of fat, yeah, so. Let's go back and see how our, how these are doing. Now you can see they're starting to express their juices. And that's why you need, this is a little bit of a process, a slow process. I'm gonna turn up the heat a little bit. What we really want to, to happen is for those juices to start to burn off before I put more beef in. Because if you don't, the next batch of beef is not gonna brown. And this is really an important flavor building piece. You really, really need to be some handy here and I'm going to grab myself a, I should have a spot slide this one, that one might slide And I'll just start lifting these out, the ones that look like they're good. Most of these look pretty good. So I'm only setting these aside just while I put the next batch into brown because I want each piece to be able to have room. I need space on the on the bottom of the pan to be able to brown properly because we want to build up what they call fond. And fond is that kind of uh, sticky, flavorful stuff on the bottom of the pan. Okay, so take these out and I'll give the pot just a second to heat up a little bit more. Now what's kind of nice about this recipe is that I know that it, beef burgundy seems like it's a pretty uh, specific thing. It has a certain way that it can be made. I always, always encourage everybody to cook by feeling because cooking is an art form. It's not a science. I mean, it is, ba baking is the science. Baking is the science. Cooking should be fun and it should be creative and artistic. And so that's why I really encourage you when you are cooking to do things the way you want to do them and not necessarily the way somebody tells you to do them. Um, because you may not like mushrooms, you may not like uh, rosemary, or maybe there's something you do like that doesn't typically appear in this recipe. Um, and you should add it. Like you could add celery if you wanted to, that's gonna give it a different mm. flavor, but um, that's one of your options for sure. All right. Any questions so far, Nico? Uh, no. Okay. Well, if there are any questions, you let me know. All right. Looks pretty good. Smells really good. Smells really good. So we'll do, I think we got this batch and then one more, and then we'll get going with uh, building up the sauce. Yeah, I've turned up the heat just a little bit now because uh, we want to sort of sear this a little bit more quickly. So this is going to get a little bit hotter. You want it a little hotter for the meat than you do with the bacon. Yeah, there we go. Now we're getting a nice brown. So if you're just joining us, we are doing beef burgundy today. <laughs> and the, the reasons are these. We're doing beef burgundy because it's cold outside and it's turning into fall. And this is a really nice warming smell to have in the house. I had a bottle of wine that I didn't like at all. I got a bottle of wine. I was joining one of those wine clubs. I think I joined the first leaf one and it's, it's okay. I'm not super impressed so far. But um, one of the bottles was like, I didn't care for it. And I know everybody says, don't put bad wine into uh, a beef burgundy because you're gonna be, that, that'll change the flavor. You should use really good wine. I don't buy that for a second, honestly. I mean, sure, maybe if I had the money to buy a $50 bottle of wine to put into a beef burgundy, it would turn out a little bit better than the one that uses the $5 bottle, but you know what? I think it's okay. So what I actually did is I've been saving up 
wine that I don't really like drinking. I've been setting it aside, and I'm going to use that as the basis for my beef burgundy. So, oh, we, have a, we have a few questions in the chat. Sure, go ahead. Um, Mary Lee Sheffer, I am going, just a quick warning to everybody in the chat, I'm going to butcher all of your names. <laughs> um, Mary Lee Sheffer uh, asks, what's the knife you recommend? The knife that I recommend, well, these ones I just got, and they're E-U-N-A, and you can find them on Amazon. I'll try to put a link up. They are incredibly sharp. The other ones I've been using is I got these IKEA ones, which are the top IKEA. These are not inexpensive, actually, but the reason I, it, I encourage you to look at ones like this is that you can see right here at the very end, it's open. And what I mean by that is I learned my lesson with my original set of expensive knives. These are ones I've had for 20 years that are Henkel's knives, but you can see this has a tang right here. This has a little piece that comes down, so you can't sharpen it all the way. Oh. When it's like this, you can sharpen all the way to the end. So that's the thing you need to look for when you buy knives, is when you sharpen them, can the blade run all the way through the sharpener? Because otherwise, the blades get kind of deformed. Um. So, I'm replacing knives uh, that I've had for years. Henkel's have been good for those, but that there's a lot of kind of knockoffs on the market right now that you can get from Amazon, for example, that um, are pretty darn good. So the German ones are lovely, but I'm not exactly in that income tax bracket at the moment. <laughs> Diana Gonclaves Connolly asks, uh, how much do you pay your film crew? Nico, how much do I pay you? Uh, you pay us in food. I do. He gets to eat what I'm making, so. The best payment snuggles too. Oh yeah. You get food and you get snuggles and you get a, a partner to play board games with, right? Yeah. Oh, and you get a place to live too. That's also <laughs> Having a place to live is nice, right? Yeah. So some kids have to take out the trash, but my kids have to film me cooking and they have to help me with my, my blog and with all of my... We also have trash. Yes, you also Okay, so if you look and you see, doing it in batches like this has made a really big difference because all of the juices that have that accumulate when you sear meat, um, they can evaporate. So if I had dumped all of the meat in at once, I'd have meat piled up to here, but the meat actually wouldn't brown and it would turn, it would just become a big soupy mess on the bottom as because the meat is letting out fat and juices and such as it's going, so. All right. It's getting nice and brown. Oh yeah, I like to see that. Look at that. That's a nice brown here. It smells so good. I feel like stopping right now and just eating this. Don't a roast that's, that's on sale. I just put for a sale roast, and then um, I cut it up myself. And you also can control how big your meat pieces are, and I know that buying a pre-cut is nice because it's, like, lazy, but... Okay, so... Oh, yeah, and uh, Hazel Jansen yeah. um, we, uh, asks, uh, I missed the beginning, what cut of beef did you use? And... and it's a beef chuck pot roast. So, uh, chuck pot roast, which I got in a Safeway. So, I got, this is about four pounds. I always like to go big when I do um, a beef burgundy because it takes so long. So, I do more beef than other recipes. Might, might as well make it worth it. Might as well. All right, so I'm adding now in the onions. And I'm leaving some of the meat in. Not all of it, obviously, but just some so that the meat and the onions kind of end up flavoring each other together. And what I'm going to do is start to brown the onions with the beef a little bit. And then in a minute or two after this is browned, I'm going to add in the carrots. Now, I don't need to fully cook the onions or fully cook the carrots. I have this on a medium high flame now because the real point is that I want these to start to kind of get that, you know, roasted brown brownness on them that creates the flavor. So they don't need to cook all the way through. They're almost just more like seared. Uh, some people put in carrots at the end, 
I like to do it now because I think that when you add the onions and carrots now, they can develop more of that flavor that I'm I keep talking about. So we want to make sure that we're always building flavor. So it's like, think about like layers on top of each other like that. So we just keep building up the flavor. Uh, and you want medium high heat at this point to be able to do that. Okay, so then the next thing, while we're waiting for that to, to do its thing, I'm gonna come over and grab my garlic. And as always with the garlic, the best way to do garlic is put your knife on the side and smash it down like that because that means that the peel slips right off. And this is where you can do as much as you want. Uh, I'm gonna start with these four cloves and then I'll kind of smell the sauce and see if I feel like it needs. Uh, mm. Do you like more garlic or less garlic? It smells like it needs more garlic. You always think it needs more garlic. Yeah, garlic is good though. Garlic is always good. It keeps the vampires away, right? <laughs> Especially around uh, Halloween. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we're getting the garlic done. Yeah, I guess this is more than four cloves. It's five or six, probably. It's it's some Ooh, garlic. Got a little. Some garlic is some garlic is, and that's kind of the point with all of these Cucina Quarantina recipes is. You should do what works for you. Oh, wow. That is a very strong garlic smell. I know. Hmm, I wonder why that could possibly be. Uh, because it's garlic? <laughs> Jeez. You're really good at that. I'm really good at what? Mincing that garlic. Well, and this is why I would never use a garlic press. I know some people love garlic presses because they think they're easier. Garlic presses irritate me for the reason it's hard to clean. And another reason I don't use a garlic press is that when you squish it like that, it doesn't flavor food the same way. When you do it like this, you can chop it as finely as you want. I couldn't, min I couldn't mince garlic with a knife for my life. Oh, I will teach you someday, my love. So yeah, a good way to mince, you hold one end of the knife, and then you just go up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down like this. And back and forth, like in a fanning motion, like this, watch, fan. Fan up, scoop, fan back down, right? Okay. Scoop, fan up. That's the best way to get that mincing going. All right, let's get back over to our onions and beef. Oh, now those are looking really good. Getting some good browning action there. So I think it's time to add the carrots. These definitely aren't gonna cook through because, you know, they're carrots. I kind of cheated today. I was going to go pull up garden carrots, but it's cold outside, so I just used the little baby peeled carrots from my garden. Why don't you swing around this way? Ah, uh, MJ O'Connor says that I'm a great commenter. commentator. Aww. Thank you. Thanks, MJ. And MJ, we missed you on the Patreon thing. Um, we missed you on the Patreon thing accidentally because you started, you tried to join right as I clicked hang up because our um, our chat, our Patreon chat after our walk with Charlie started at 9.45 and lasted a half hour. So we, we saw you, but just as soon as it was over. So sorry about the time that you didn't make it in time, but hopefully I'll see you on Wednesday. And for those of you watching, Wednesdays are now going to be Patreon travel talk nights. So I have a travel talk ready I'm going to do for you just as a recap of what I did when I was in Italy uh, in the past month. And I'll show you some great slides of Sicily and of uh, Rome. And then I wanted to kind of talk to you a little bit about those who are interested about what travel is going to be like in the future because it's going to be different, I think. All right, so now that the carrots are in there, the meat is browning, I'm going to add the garlic in. Garlic should always be added later in a recipe, never at the beginning. Because, Why is that? Because if you started like this, the actual flavor of the garlic would probably cook away. Oh. Yeah, you want to add it later in the recipe so it maintains sort of a fresh, vibrant flavor. Garlicky. <laughs> Garlicky flavor. So, I'm going to get that in there. And again, this is up to you. If you don't like garlic, you don't have to do much if you don't want. Okay, so now that we are in this place, I'm going to give it one minute. Um, we need to add, where'd it go? What happened to the tomato base? Is that the Uh, 
Last I saw it, it was over there. Hmm. Oh, maybe. So tomato paste is the next thing. Uh, oh, there it is. You found it? Yeah. Oh, it was good. Toothpaste tube of tomato paste. So I'm going to add that in in a few minutes. This one you can see, this is Muti. Reality um, cooking show. And it's exactly like a toothpaste tube. So you stab it and it comes out like this. This is my favorite way to have tomato sauce around the house because I never use a whole can. So. Yeah, you always like use like three quarters of a can and then it just sits there and festers. Yeah, exactly. So I don't it's a way to avoid waste. Oh boy, that is smelling really good. What do you think, Nico? Wow. Yeah? That smells delicious. Okay. Okay, so now that we've got some good fond going, I think we've got some nice color. Um, I think it's time to put in, we're not just yet, we're getting there, but now we want to make the gravy. Um, so I'm taking flour. This is about, oh, a third a cup of flour, more or less. And I'm just going to put that over the top of the beef. That looks very weird. I know. I never thought I would see flour over beef. Yep. What I'm going to do now is mix this in with all the vegetables and the meat. And I'm going to let it cook for just a minute or two. Oh, sure cut down on the sizzling. It did. And it's going to start to smell kind of uh, spicy a little bit. Toasty. I'm going to start putting in the pepper, 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 right? <laughs> okay. And now uh, that we have this a little bit cooked and mixed in, now that's the time that we add our wine and our beef broth. So I'm going to start with the wine because what we want to do is use the wine to deglaze the pan. So any of those nice little toasty bits that are stuck to the bottom, we want to get up. See Look, Nico, you can see. You see the toasty bits there? Oh, <gasps> the toasty bits. Yeah, so we want those toasty bits. So we're going to add the wine and then scrape up. You just want to do a scraping motion on the bottom. Scrape, scrape, scrape. And then I'm going to add and keep scraping. Add wine. You can adjust how much wine you want to do here. I've got three cups here, which is the traditional amount that if you don't like so much wine in your sauce, you can also just substitute broth. You don't need to worry that you're going to get drunk from eating this. I know there was a concern from one of my children that too much alcohol would, would make you drunk. That was not me, by the way. Yes. But that's not how this works because... All the alcohol cooks away. All the alcohol cooks away. So we've got... And then, you, and then you just have this nice wine flavor. Yeah. So we've got three cups of wine. Now we're going to add the tomato paste, which I'm going to do uh, probably two nice big squirts, which is probably about a big fat tablespoon. And tomato paste is nice because it adds a depth of flavor, but not a specific tomato taste. So this should be tomato -y tasting soup, or a, a stew. It should be wine flavored, obviously. Yeah. Okay, and now we've got our beef broth, which is already open. Don't use chicken broth, use beef broth. They taste really different. And I don't even like making my own beef broth. It never turns out that great. So just canned beef broth is just fine. Okay, so I'm gonna let that start to bubble, bubble, bubble. Give me some bubbles here. Mmm, smells really good. Can you smell that, Nico? Wow, that is a, what is that flavor? What, what's that smell? I don't know what that it's smells like. More pepper. Lots of pepper if you like that. Generously spiced with freshly ground pepper. Uh -huh. And now I'm going to add my mushrooms. Now these mushrooms, I took them out of the bag and I kind of crushed them because they come in kind of bigger pieces like that. So I crushed them and rehydrated them first. And they have a really nice flavor. Now mushrooms do go in beef burgundy, but these ones are not in there to be the mushrooms that you eat in the way that you probably have had beef burgundy before. These are just to add flavor. So you could even really grind these up into like a like almost a flour or finely, finely, finely chop them. Uh, it's sort of up to you. The only thing about dried mushrooms, see I'm putting the liquid in there too. The only thing about dried mushrooms is that they never fully become 
soft. They kind of end up being a little chewy, so it's always better with dried mushrooms to chop them up pretty finely. But these are just for flavor. And then on top of this, one more thing, because I just want to keep adding the flavor, is we have this fun thing that I got at Trader Joe's. It's a multi-purpose umami seasoning blend, which is, what is it? It is onions, uh, mustard seed, porcini mushroom powder, button mushroom powder, and red pepper. Um, so I'm just going to sprinkle a little bit of that in there too because I'm always hoping to add that flavor that you can't put your finger on. Just that umami that just sort of has just a little bit of, um, you know, you need that base note. It's like the base note of cooking. Okay, this looks pretty good. Smells good. It's the nice combination, the right combination of scents. And then in goes the rest of the meat with all of its juice. So I know beef burgundy seems like a really big project, but actually we're almost done. So Wait, what? Yeah, we're almost done uh, because we put it all together. Uh, the next thing I want to put in here is I'm going to toss in some rosemary sprigs from the garden. Thank you, Nico, for getting those. Just going to toss those in and mix them around. Don't be afraid to add too much rosemary, by the way. Well, no, there is too much rosemary. Rosemary is a funny thing. It's pretty powerful. I'm leaving it whole. You could chop it. The recipe that I was basing this on said to chop it, but I'm leaving it whole because I'm going to pull it out later. I think chopping it is a little too aggressive on the rosemary front. Yeah, so I, what I feel I'm... like that would just make it... I feel, I feel like that would make the rosemary flavor overpower everything else. Yeah, it would. So I'm just waiting a second here. I'm letting it bubble up. Give it a good shot there, Nico, so people can see it's bubbling, bubbling. So this is beef burgundy. So to review what we have, we have four pounds of beef. We had about a cup of carrots, a cup of onions that were roughly chopped. Uh, we have tomato paste. We have three cups of wine, uh, about a cup of beef broth, and then um, dried porcini mushrooms that were chopped up and they're the liquid from rehydrating them, which was about another cup. Um, and we put some flour on to make sort of a gravy. And as this is starting to bubble, you can kind of come in and see that it's not a super thick sauce yet. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay with it being less gravy and more liquidy uh, because I want to make sure that all of the pieces of meat are covered to the oven. Uh, but then when Wait, I take the oven? it out, yeah, I'm going to put it in the oven. That's the trick here. Uh, it's going to end up getting cooked in the oven in just a second. So when I take it out later on, I'll take the meat out, and if the sauce hasn't cooked down enough, at that point I can return just the sauce without the meat to the stove, and I can either cook it down, or I can add a little bit of flour to thicken it to the sauce, the kind of thickness of gravy that I want uh, on my beef burgundy. Let me taste it and see how we're doing. It's really good. Oh, really good. I did forget something though, and that is the salt. So I'm not going to put too much in now. I'm just going to get it rolling with salt. And then later on... Shows um, off uh, like five different kinds of salt. I know we have too many different kinds of salt in the house. We have kosher salt, table salt, Sicilian sea salt, pink curing salt. There's just Chef pink. salt. Chef salt. Yeah, we've got too many kinds of salt in this house. Okay, so I'm feeling pretty good about this. At this point, you could decide what you want to do. If there's something else that you would like in this recipe, you could add it now. Uh, if you wanted thyme, for example, which might be a good idea. Hmm, thyme would be nice. You could add just whatever it is you like. Tarragon. I, mean, I wouldn't think of tarragon. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways you can go. But I think at this point, I'm pretty happy with what I've got. Okay, so I'm going to turn off the oven. I've already, or at the stove, I've got the oven at 350. So I'm going to pop the lid on here. And then I'm going to go ahead and grab and pop this into our prepared oven at 3. Oh. Oh, I, oh, I knew this was going to happen. Okay. Remove this. This is a live <laughs> cooking show, you know, so you never know when things are going to be funky. We're going to have to move this. And that can go over here. Live disassembling of an oven. Yeah. All right. In we go. Okay. So. That's going to go in there, and it can stay in there for about two hours. So now wow. this is going to be the thing, is we're going to leave it in there for two hours. So I'll check it in about an hour and see how it's doing. It may need less time. 
and we're, done, and we're gonna stay live all that time. <laughs> uh, what we're gonna do, however, is when it's done, the last step on this is to make mashed potatoes for one thing, but then also to take white button mushrooms and saute them, an entire carton of them. And then I add them, saute them in butter and add them at the end. If you put mushrooms in now, they're gonna shrivel and disappear and they'll be in the sauce, but you won't be able to actually taste them. So that's the very last step. So there you go. I will finish this up and in a couple hours, I'll add a picture in the comments section to show you how it turned out. So there you go. Beef burgundy live from my kitchen in Seattle. You can do it too. And hopefully, oh, you'll be able to enjoy this wonderful fall wow. aroma in your home too. What do you think, Nico? That's a nice smell. It That's a really nice. nice smell. So you can serve it either with whipped mashed potatoes, garlic mashed potatoes, or uh, egg noodles. That's the other thing that you could potentially serve it with. Pot potatoes are more the traditional. Okay. Lizzie so, just popped into the background um, there. <laughs> all right, everybody. So that's Cucina right. Quarantena for tonight. Thank you for joining me once again uh, for this beef burgundy recipe. Uh, and if you want, I will uh, go ahead and upload this recipe to Patreon so that you have the, uh, the list of all the ingredients. But you can actually base your version on many, many different recipes that you can find in Julia Child or on the internet. And remember, it's always up to you. What you like is more important than what any recipe will ever tell you and also what you have in hand. So we'll see you again tomorrow for another episode of Cucina Quarantena and some more adventures coming up later this week. Ciao for now.